So we are ready for the first session in the afternoon. It's the data management session, and I would kindly ask Mir Blaško to chair this session instead of Pavel Kino, who is not able to come. Thank you. So we have uh, three papers. Uh, and uh, the first paper is uh, user-driven ontology population from linked data sources. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, comparison of different approaches for hotel uh, the duplication, and I would uh, welcome the uh, Ivan Kos uh, Zednikov uh, and Vladimir uh, Gorovi. Okay. Screen, yeah. Yeah. Uh, control L. Control L. Okay, hello everyone. I think we can begin. My name is Vladimir Grabovi. Uh, and uh, we'll present together today with uh, Ivan Kozhevnikov and uh, we can congratulate Ivan with his birthday because he, today he, he has a birthday, so let's applaud. <laughs> so he's presenting on this really good day. And um, we both together work uh, in Yandex, uh, work on Yandex Rail project and also we present to universities. Um, uh, my university is the same as state university I represent Radio School of Management and one represents it more university from which we have a lot of participants today. So our topic uh, is uh, portals of application. So uh, at first I'll tell you uh, a little bit about our project, what we do. So we work for Yandex Travel. It's a meta search for uh, tool packages and uh, portal meta search. And actually the main thing that it uh, uh, helps you to do is to save money. So in, in my example, particular example, when I looked for a portal in Prague, uh, I found the uh, Andante portal, which is like five minutes of work from here. And uh, it was cheaper for four, for, for these four nights, for during this conference, it was cheaper for 4,000 rubles than uh, on one source than on the other. So in our case, it is, you see this Russian resort, it has 23,000 rubles and Booking.com uh, had only as cheap as 27,000 rubles. It's about, the difference is about 60 euros. So we were able to save our university some money. Uh, and uh, uh, in order to save money, you really need to solve the problem of uh, somehow merging hotels coming from different, different sources. Somehow we needed to understand that this hotel, and then the hotel from ok to go with the same as the Andante portal from booking.com. And it sounds very easy, yeah? So you just, they're on the same place. Yeah, say the same name, so, but uh, there are some difficulties as we'll see. And uh, uh, also there is an interesting problem that uh, sometimes even our partners from uh, which we take hotel data uh, have some duplicates in their database. So we get their database and you can find some duplicates even there. Um, so, uh, how do you think? Is there a simple solution? Uh, do you have any ideas how would you solve this problem if you had this one to solve? Compare any ideas? Yeah, name? Compare the names. Compare the names. If they're the same, yeah, 
then totals probably are the same. So other ideas? What other? Location. Location, yeah. So actually we were with the same with the same naive approach. We we now a team we decided, okay, so hotels they should have the same name and they should be located nearby. Yeah? So so you guessed how <laughs> how we worked on this. And uh, uh, so it's a kind of nice solution. We actually uh, made it a bit more complicated because uh, there are some mistakes in co coordinates and so we just uh, compare the hotels which are not further than four kilometers uh, from each other in terms of coordinates and uh, from the hotel names we removed uh, some mar common markers like apartments, hotels and then we compared shingle set because some they, some, sometimes they change the names order and so uh, we thought that it will work quite well. Uh, and what we found out that it doesn't work sometimes. So here are some examples of why it doesn't work. So here we see the Caribbean World Hotel uh, from um, uh, Osterwalk and Level Travel, two of our partners, and we see that uh, Level Travel has wrong coordinates, just 11 kilometers from the, from the place, so it's, it's quite far away. Uh, and it's, uh, actually this is an interface that we created to compare and very, very quickly to hotels. So you see the main characteristics, hotels, coordinates, regions data, stars, and so on and so forth. So it's, it was very convenient for us when we were doing, we were doing this. So other interesting examples. So uh, uh, two hotels, uh, one is called Pristin, other is called Primoria. Different names, completely different names, same place. Uh, and even they are coming from the same source. Stodian Hotel, so it's the same source, and they're the same. So different names from the same source in one building, completely different, no shingles uh, are the same. Uh, so uh, they are the same. And uh, the, actually one example that really we were shocked uh, by is an uh, example in the city, Russian city called Chelyabinsk. Uh, there was a building in which there are two different hotels. One is called, how do you think? One is called Chelyabinsk, and the other is also called Chelyabinsk. <laughs> one is located on the third floor, the other one is located on the fourth floor. We were really thinking in our team, what were the ideas of the owners of the hotels, why they decided to create two hotels with the same names in the same building on different floors, but it happens uh, in Russia, so we were really shocked when we received this from our support team. Uh, we were laughing a lot. So, so to just summarize, um, we, there are mistakes in coordinates. Sometimes you have different hotels in the same building. Sometimes you have identical hotels with different names. And sometimes you have uh, different hotels with identical names. So uh, we were discouraged with this result and you see that the numbers were not, we, actually with this naive approach, were not very good. Um, so the precision wasn't even high enough. Recall is okay, but even precision wasn't wasn't good. And uh, so what we decided to do next, we decided to use human experts because we have um, this is a Margarita from our team, and she's really great at doing hotel deduplication task. So when we are uh, looking for some hotels, sometimes uh, we even turn to her help because we even we don't understand that are this is them or not. And she is uh, really good. She can always explain why they are the same or, or they are not. She uses like Google Maps, Yandex Maps. Uh, they go, they, she goes and read reviews in difficult cases. She also uh, sometimes goes to the official sites, see that the same brand has different hotels nearby with well, very similar names. And even recently, some, sometimes in rare, quite rare cases, she has to phone to hotels and ask what is going on in this building because they are really very, very difficult cases. So, and this is great, she does a great job. Uh, in terms of quality, it's the best that we can achieve. So we, we, uh, about, we, we achieve about 100% accuracy. It's really great. Uh, but uh, the problem with that, it's uh, quite expensive. Uh, if she goes for cases, sometimes it's like one minute or less, sometimes it's up to 20 minutes to resolve the, the particular pair of hotels to classify. And uh, we estimate that, yeah, it will cost us a lot of money. And uh, the other problem is that uh, you really uh, 
cannot scale it in very fast in very quickly because you have to hire uh, some 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 experts and you have to teach them because even we in our team we are in this domain uh, in some difficult cases we have to turn to her for, for help we can't do it ourselves so you, you have to somehow teach how to do it so and when it, yeah when a big com partner comes it will you will just stuck in doing this so what do you think shall we give up we were thinking about what we should do next and uh, uh, then we decided to that we should uh, try how do you think what to try next any ideas not yet we, we tried we, at first we wanted to uh, try some cheap approach if we had decided that if machines are not so good but humans are okay at least for like uh, not very difficult cases we decided to try crowdsourcing approach so we uh, thought that we will somehow tune our naive approach to to, to be it with a high precision and then we'll uh, just uh, identify the gray zone of some photos where the the algorithm is not sure and we'll pass it to humans and uh, we actually in uh, you know that there is amazon can Futuk solution and in russia we have yandex developed uh, its own platform called taloka it's good that it has russian speaking audience and we have a lot of russian hotels so it, it was good for us and we just decided to, okay we'll pass all the gray zone to talokers uh, uh, they will do kind of tasks in a novel up manner so we we just one task just consisted of five pairs of hotels and uh, then the, the same the same task was uh, deployed to five talkers different talkers so we can just get the votes finally and decide whether they vote for hotels being different or hotels being the same um, so what were the results so we paid two cents for each task uh, of consisting of five photos because we've had all of five colloquers it costs like uh, yeah, uh, two cents for photo pay classification and the results were quite good but the problem is that um, they're a bit too optimistic because the cases that we presented them were not very hard so they were not and in hard cases it was always like 50 50 we then looked at our golden set and we saw that in, uh, in difficult cases it was like 50 50 year. they because they get money on the prepaid manner so we don't check there is only the only way of control is that uh, if they like do uh, less than 80 percent on golden sets then we switch them off but uh, they get money uh, d n not depending on the quality of them we just don't let them do other tasks so uh, but yeah for, for for the money it was much cheaper than using human expert and it was scalable so much better uh, so uh, and uh, we decided that we couldn't work with this approach and uh, that we need some other solution that you actually suggested and the one will talk to you about how we we have done it yes so we moved further and we decided that the best method is a human expert but we want to automate it so to learn machine to be like a human um, so but let's move from the duplication task to the classification task it's rather easy we have two hotels we should compare them and to say if we are the same or not but there is a problem uh, if we have uh, n hotels, then we will have squared n hypotheses. And it's a big problem because for a big partners, we have about 1 million hotels, and then we calculate how much there are hypotheses. So we should reduce somehow this number of hypotheses. Do you have any ideas how can we do it? Uh, so, okay, uh, we had an idea that uh, close, uh, there is no uh, different hotels, no, the same hotels are close to each other. So there were some ideas, for example, what if we can uh, compare hotels in the same region? We can do it in uh, several ways. For example, we can use uh, reverse geocoding. It means we have a point, then we go to some, for example, Google Maps, 
and it gives us the address. So let's use, for example, uh, city name and then compare all pairs in the city. But unfortunately, it doesn't work because, as you remember, we have problems in coordinates and uh, even the same hotels due to diversity of coding have different city cities. Uh, the other approach is to use uh, location, uh, I mean uh, region which passed by the partners. So partners says us that this hotel is located in Prague, for example. But we face the problem that they pass this information in different ways. And we have other problem to unify them. And sometimes they pass even different countries. Uh, for example, this uh, Michelangelo Resort and Spa. Uh, the, if I'm not mistaken, it's located on the Kos island, and one partner passes that it's in Kos, Greece, but other partner says us that it's located in the Tokyo. But it is the same kind, the same hotel. So, uh, but actually we have a coordinates, and uh, we came to idea to split a surface into the squares. Not very big squares, squares with site about 10 kilometers, and the idea is that two identical hotels are located in the same or adjacent squares. It drastically re removes the number of hypotheses. Uh, I think it approximately the linear from n number of hotels. Uh, and so let's move further to our machine learning. It's very easy. We have a machine, uh, classification task. Let's invent some factors then tune model and so everything could be okay. But the question is what factors to use? Um, your ideas? What? Classification about the hotel, like number of rooms, uh, the new features. Like yes, yes, features. Well, we have two, two hotels and we should invent some features to say so. so the number of rooms, the uh, price, the uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Yes, cool. Uh, sorry? Everything you have available in the description of hotels. Uh, yes, but there is a problem that, oh, okay, we have two names of hotels, but how to compare them? Good idea, yep. Okay, uh, we had some categories of features. The first category is name-based features, and we first we tried the simplest one. We just split it in three grams and used the Jacquard index to compare two names. But uh, it was not too good. Then we invented a uh, name subset similarity. So we have a name, just a string. We split it in the words and we use Jacquard index. Uh, also, we used Levenstein distance. Uh, it uh, helped us to avoid misprints. But it didn't work again because there is some interesting thing about the hotels. Sometimes hotels contain information about the location where they are located. For example, there are a lot of hotels in Manhattan and all of them have Manhattan in their name. And it's a problem because we compare and we, the similar, similarity is too high. Uh, so I forgot to tell about that we, yes, we use TFDF, uh, but TFDF doesn't work about these location words. And uh, uh, the idea is to use local TFDF. It means that EDF part is calculated not over the old corpus, uh, only uh, on uh, small location near the hotel, about four kilometers. Then, then Manhattan uh, will take uh, much more little weight than other words. Uh, the next uh, bunch of features is uh, location features. The easiest one is to use distance. The closer the hotels are, the more they are similar. But it doesn't work again. The problem here is that if the distance between two hotels in Moscow is about one kilometer, it's a very big distance. Probably they are different. But somewhere in desert, Sakara, for example, if the distance is four kilometers, it's okay because there are small amount of hotels in this desert. So then we moved first and we invented uh, local density. It means how many hotels are in the near area about the hotel, average distance between hotels uh, in this area again. And also we used the uh, address TFADL. Partners give us text address, so TFADF again. And uh, of course, we didn't use here local TFIDF, local address TFIDF, because there is no meaning, because all addresses in the same area have the, a lot of common words. 
uh, the next bunch of features are about photo. Uh, all uh, human experts are looking at the photo. If two hotels have the same photos, they are identical. But it's easy to compare them by human, but it's very difficult to compare them automatically. We use two approaches. The first is uh, perceptual hashing. Uh, the idea here is to convert the image to a small string. And if two images are similar, then the dis distance between the two hashes are similar too. The idea here is to put image to grayscale uh, and then resize it to, for example, 44 or 64 to 64 pixels and to then put it to one vector and to compare them with Levenstein, for example. Uh, the, other way, the other way is using uh, neural network features. What does it mean? Uh, we take big neural network, we train it on some, some images. For example, we took ImageNet database, it has a lot of images, they have a lot of classes, we just train this uh, neural network, and then we get one layer of this network as a feature vector. Then again, two similar photos will uh, have the similar distance between vectors. Uh, okay, and just used as some features, so we put here all information we have. For example, we uh, had features as same source. It means that if hotel uh, came from same partners, is the probability they are different much higher. But not, it's not always true. Uh, also, we used hotel type. What does it mean? Uh, there are a lot of types of hotels. For example, apartments, chalet, hotel, uh, no, house. And uh, sometimes it's very important. If they are the same, the probability they are identical is higher. Uh, we used also phone similarity, uh, URL similarity, star similarity. It means star similarity. You know, hotels have stars. The high stars, the, the high the quality uh, of the hotel. And it's very strange that in our methods, star similarity worked not good. We don't know why. Uh, also, so. And now about methods. We tried several methods. Uh, for example, random forest, gradient boosting, uh, log logistic regression. Uh, we tuned our models with grid search. Uh, random forest and, log and gradient boosting was the best. Uh, logistic regression was not so good about the features, you know, because there are a lot of missing failures and random forest good uh, works well. Uh, and the final result is about the 99 precision and 98 re recall, and it's very good. Let's compare with other our results. Uh, we can see that machine learning is the best. Uh, it's even better than crowdsourcing, but it's free. Uh, but there are some challenges with, when we face now with this uh, approach. Uh, the first is uh, part, new partners. New partners came, they give us new data, when we should retrain our model again. Uh, also, there is a problem with apartments because there are much more apartments than hotels and they change their names uh, very often. They use common images and it not, work not so good. Uh, and also we have a lot of bunch of hotels and we should rerun our process of deduplication because users, uh, partners often change uh, the coordinates, names, just fix the mistakes. And we should run this process to fix problems in our duplication too. Uh, and it's, we should scale it to a lot of machines because uh, in its all memories doesn't fit into memory in one machine. We should spread it. Um, and <clears throat> that, so, so what we do the, and what we can use in other uh, tasks uh, related to this, it's uh, photo-based features. I think you can use it in any deduplication task when you have photos. Also, the great idea is about local-based features. Uh, so, and as you know, it's the um, first deduplication task solved with such quality. Uh, so, thanks. And your questions now? Sorry? Are you buying any of Kaggles? Do you know what Kaggles? Uh-huh, Kaggles, yeah, Kaggles. So, uh, a few months ago there was 
the conversation about this application as selection. Mm -hmm. So if you use the same task, uh, there were a lot of people taking part in it. And the data set, I believe, that they had uh, was much bigger than yours. And they basically used the same techniques as you. And add some few additional ones. So, for example, I noticed that you didn't mention comparing a large histogram, but it was a technique by widely used in the competition there. Mm -hmm. So, perhaps you would like to check the competition and what they could use it because there are articles from the top one competitions, the feature presentations. Mm, cool. But then you just they use also photos or? Uh, uh, they, no, they compared uh, advertisements. Advertisement. So, on the photo of Avito, I believe it's a Russian concept, but it's yeah. kind of sure. Avito is a classified, yeah, it's a big classified where you have so, uh, yeah. some. There are some differences because, for example, when you have an advertisement, it's obvious that photos are taken by different person, and when you have photos, the photos might be taken by other people, so there might be some factors behind it that actually make it look totally different. But I believe that the vast majority of the technicians is there. I also have to take a look at the photos. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. You, you have a finite classifier, right? Yes. One or zero. Mm -hmm. If you have a problem of five photos, you don't want to be accurate. I mean, within a ten kilometer mm -hmm. sequence, you have ten, several, ten names, mm -hmm. and then you have to decide if like three of them is a hotel, seven of them are another hotel, or there are ten hotels actually. Yes. How do you deal with such a case? So we compare each pairwise. You? We compare them pairwise. Pairwise, so it's kind of a uh, clustering task. Yeah, and yes. then you have to like group, like you group these pairwise. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so and then you have clusters. Like in graph, you have disconnected component. Yeah. Exactly. So I think it could be complete, complete with its pipeline, just to add the clustering phase, which you will handle such case. Just have a clustering layer. To have these ten photos, for example. But we, I, I don't think that we need it because when you have links, you know that you, you have a graph of photos and you have links. If the photos are the same, you have a link and then you have a like. You, you have like ten, ten variations. Of, I mean, you need a photo example. So let's imagine that you have a triangle graph. Yeah. And you have ten uh, descriptions of photos. Mm -hmm. So you make three edges and your uh, machine learning algorithm decided that two of the edges be. Uh, uh, say that those photos are the same, but the first one says those photos are different. What do you do in such case? We posterize them in one. We, so we just find one connected. And connection. Yes, we find connected components. We look at it, it like in the graph, and then we find all components in that graph. And it works well. So in, in a, a really, if, if you estimate it further, look at the clusters, finally, you see that uh, we, we were right. Okay. If they're connected, we have some third party photo. Two photos are connected. Not this, that. I mean, this layer of analysis is it like. Graph clustering thing maybe should be part of maybe the maybe a complete uh, solution. No, I'm not sure because we solved we solved our with with components we solved our task and the quality of clusters was good enough. So you, you don't have to use this final link if they are even not connected by all the algorithm but are connected by third party photo. For example, you can imagine the case where the half of the photos of one partner are are the same as how the photos, uh, photos of the other partner and the third have another part of photos and uh, we, we have these links, they are all interlinked and so the it, photos it, are the same, uh, we have some features. I would like to, to stop this discussion. Wait, we can discuss it. Run out of yeah. time, so at coffee break I suggest yeah. to, to continue. And so let me introduce... <laughs>
especially in uh, related topics for the open courseware. So this is uh, the first paper. Uh, we want to know what is the state of the art and what are the um, standards and technique uh, in the um, in web accessibility that are addressed by the semantic uh, technologies. Um, so this is a literature review. Uh, first of all, what is the web accessibility? Web accessibility is how you make the web content accessible to people with disability. For example, uh, a, for um, a blind person can um, use uh, screen readers to, um, uh, to listen rather than reading the web content. This is a very simple example. Or even uh, someone with a motor uh, impairment can use, um, uh, uh, instead of a mouse, something like a joystick, special uh, device. Uh, so this is simply the, the idea of the web accessibility. We have four types of uh, impairments. The visual impairments, which are related to uh, the sensory, the, um, the blindness, the um, total blindness, the uh, color blindness, and any other thing related to the visual. Um, and we have different severity of each impairment, actually. Uh, we have the uh, hearing impairment, deaf, uh, pe people that are totally deaf or have problem in hearing. We have the motor impairment, people who cannot use their um, 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 upper limb muscles. Uh, of course, there are some other for the lower limbs, but we are not interested here uh, because this doesn't prevent them from using uh, the computer. Um, the fourth one is the cognitive impairments, and the cognitive impairments are the sum related to um, the, um, like the dyslexia and the learning uh, disabilities. Uh, I don't know if you have an uh, idea about this, but for example, there are some people who cannot read um, uh, very long paragraphs and have upside down, uh, reading characters like upside down, and this is are some kind of learning disabilities. Alzheimer and autism, all these are cognitive impairments. Um, the objective of our, of our survey, we uh, reviewed uh, the existing standards and technologies uh, and the available ontologies regarding the web accessibility. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, listed some findings and some missing, we think we can work on them, that will be future uh, research di directions. Um, uh, we focused on uh, four standard guide, uh, four, uh, 11 uh, standard and guidelines. Uh, I'll list them below uh, in the coming slides. And um, we have investigated uh, 20 uh, ontologies. Uh, 17 of them are uh, implemented with OWL, uh, and only 11 of them are available online, which we could test and uh, check. Uh, for the accessibility standard and guidelines, we were checking um, on how um, to make the web accessible. So uh, there are already standards in the web accessibility, and the most known one is the WCAG 2.0. It's a W3C uh, guideline and standard, ISO standard now. So uh, when we, uh, let me tell you an example. For example, uh, when um, you are making a website and there is an image, this image should have an alt um, a description. So that means that this should, should be accessible so that the screen reader can read this website. Um, so for example, this is one guideline of the WCAG, the simplest one, there are more complicated, like uh, you should have a special spacing between the lines and there is much more guidelines. So uh, and there are other um, uh, standards like the BBC standard and the IBM standard and other standards. They are listed in the paper. Um, another standard we, are, um, um, we, we need to focus on is how to describe a disability, how to know that what are the limitations of the people um, with, with, for example, learning disabilities. There are many varieties, how to describe them, how to describe what they can do and how to describe what they cannot do. Is there a standard that says something like that? We have something like the ICF, it's a WHO standard. Uh, it's a World Health uh, Organization standard which describe uh, disabilities and uh, categorize them. I'll come in the next slide. The last thing is, is there accessibility standards for the e-learning and open courseware or any educational resources? Uh, and there are already uh, standards uh, talking about this. Um, no implementation, but they, they are guidelines and um, telling how to make a, 
uh, at educational resource uh, accessible. Uh, these are the 10, we are not going through them, but I'll just take an example. Uh, this is the ICF, the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health. This is the one I was telling that this should describe, for example, they categorize the, uh, that, that, for example, this is the sensory uh, function and the, pay, uh, and the pain, which have seeing functions, and uh, under each category you have uh, a list of, uh, for example, what is uh, the color uh, vision of this person and what is the severity of uh, his impairment. So whenever you go in this hierarchy, you get more specification. Um, let me tell you a very small example also. Uh, for example, we have something called uh, contract. Contract, this is a kind of uh, disability which make people can see, but they can see something like blur. It's not very, they cannot recognize small uh, things. They can recognize big objects, but they have problem to recognize very sm small things. They have this hazy uh, seeing sight. So they have problem when reading, they have reading difficulties. Um, so for these people, you, you may need uh, Braille, for example, as an input uh, devices. You may need uh, reading uh, screen readers for these uh, people. So from um, the specification of this uh, uh, disability, you can recognize what you should do and what are the needs of this paper, uh, these pe people. Um, another example, which is the WACAG I told you about, this is the most uh, famous and acceptable standard for web accessibility, um, uh, which uh, say, but it's mostly address uh, people with visual impairment and uh, with uh, motor uh, impairment. Um, now for the ontologies. Um, uh, for the ontologies, we have um, defined some ontologies that are existing. They address accessibility with different purposes. Some describe the disability and characteristics, which is the ICF I talked about. They already have an ontology. It's, it's on the bio portal. It's an ontology, but from a medical um, viewpoint, but it's an ontology, implemented our ontology. Um, there are other ontologies that are made for the web standards and guidelines. Uh, others that are uh, describing the assistive technology. Assistive technology is like uh, the um, uh, devices used especially for um, people with disabilities, like the screen readers uh, or the braille software or hardware. And finally, there are some ontologies on, uh, that are um, made on web content structure, which are used to restructure or reformat the web page to make it more accessible. These are the main categories which we found ontologies about. Um, these are the 20 ontology. Of course, I'm not going through all of them. I appreciate if you would have time, if you are interested, and take a look uh, for the paper. Um, um, for each one, uh, we studied um, um, what are its targeting. Uh, for each uh, ontology, we see how, uh, what it address, the user model or disability uh, uh, characteristics, uh, how they describe disability, um, and for uh, uh, others that are for assistive technologies and others for the guidelines, and if there is any others, for example, some ontologies are made to describe uh, personas uh, of special type of impairments, there are other uh, types, so these all are listed here. Actually, what we are interested in, most of the ontologies are targeting special type of impairment, mostly the visual impairment because this is the most commonly used and they have uh, very uh, clear requirements now and very clear preferences. Um, so uh, mostly the um, ontologies there are um, uh, related to the visual impairment um, and there are some others uh, targeting uh, other uh, um, other things. Um, what we are interested in and we think that it, we could continue on something like that is called an accessible. Accessible, this is an EU project. It was in 2009. It's a little bit old, but a good start. Um, uh, they have, they made in this ontology, uh, they have described the uh, disability, uh, a lot of, made an ontology of many aspects. 
for the disability user uh, characteristics, they are, are um, uh, they rely on the ICF standards, so they take the vocabulary which is related to the software, so they neglected any medical or uh, details that are not related, we don't need it. So they take only the characteristics we need uh, to use for uh, further uh, usage in software. Uh, they also uh, have an ontology, for the ontology they made for the assistive technologies and um, uh, software th that are used. Uh, they, they also have ontology on the web accessibility standards and guidelines and also for the mobile accessibility standards, but we are not uh, further into this. And at least they and uh, uh, at last they have assessment rules for mapping users um, to requirements. Um, this is just a snapshot of this ontology. Uh, it's um, just to show you. It's not, of course, all of it, but it's just to show you how an impairment is related to a disability. And this disability, uh, we have some functional limitations. And for each disability, we might have uh, special devices. Uh, and we have capabilities for users who are using this device. Of course, this is related to the guidelines and other stuff, but this is just an example. Uh, at the end, what are the findings uh, we found? Uh, first of all, the cognitive impairments are not um, addressed uh, in uh, the standards and the guidelines, uh, and we are very interested in the, uh, especially in the learning especially in the uh, people with learning disabilities because we are talking about open courseware. So I think people with learning disabilities are very important to, to us. We, we need to know how to represent an open uh, uh, an educational uh, resource to be available for people with uh, this impairment. Um, there is a cognitive A11Y. Uh, this is a task force in W3C now. They are starting a task force for, to uh, uh, start something about cognitive standards and guidelines. Um, finally, we have defined three main components if we use um, semantic technologies, um, especially ontologies to uh, it, it would, be, it would make an open courseware accessible. Uh, the course content and the browsing and navigation and the question assessment and assessment. Um, Shortly, um, first of all, if we have ontology about uh, different type of disabilities, what are their needs, uh, what are their abilities, and what are their limitations, then we can uh, represent our educational resources with different representations that are suitable for them and that match them at some point. So uh, if, if we have this, we can extract information we can uh, suggest to some, to them, um, uh, recommend some uh, valuable resources with respect to their um, disability and limitation. Um, uh, uh, if we can uh, put, for example, um, from these also ontologies, we have put the guidelines for uh, authors who are creating this um, uh, uh, resource uh, resources, this, this would be good also if we can validate these resources with, with respect to this uh, guidelines, this would also be useful and uh, I think ontologies and, um, can, can facilitate this and optimize some of these processes. Uh, finally, uh, mapping and managing these uh, courses and these, require, uh, these uh, resources by annotating and uh, um, suggesting uh, uh, that, uh, by annotating and then retrieving them with some kind of recommendation system would be good. Um, um, also for the browsing and navigation, we are talking about customizing uh, our uh, open courseware system. For example, if you know that this is one uh, technique but it's not uh, the best one, if you know that you, the user that are coming to you is a blind, you can neglect all the images and all uh, non-textual uh, content in your, in your website and just put text that is highlighted and, uh, and that is organized uh, with um, heading in a good way so you don't need to put any uh, images or any other stuff. For, this is an example, not uh, a very well uh, example, but it, it's an approach. So if you can use um, some of these ontologies to personalize, um, um, uh, make a learner profile uh, 
at some point. And this learner profile, with this learner profile, you can customize your open courseware system. This would be good. Um, at, uh, at the end, if there's another uh, area. This is the question and assessment. Also, this is another um, wide area because um, um, with respect to the user coming to you, you have to know what are the uh, questions you can propose to them. For, it, for example, for a learning uh, people with learning disability, you have uh, to um, do not give them an essay question to write. You have to give them the availability uh, to dictate the system and uh, to say this. This is an example. So if you know the kind of impairment that's coming to you, you can propose the questions that can be used. At the end, we have uh, made a literature review of the uh, web accessibility guidelines and the available ontologies that are found. Um, we listed what, we, that what are missing about the cognitive impairments. We think that the, these aspects uh, for the uh, open courseware, the course content and navigation and browsing and the assessment, if they are uh, um, addressed by open courseware, this would be a benefit. Um, the, the future work, which we are working on it now, actually, that we selected uh, two ontologies that are the accessible and an AE, AE GIS, another ontology. We use this ontology to represent learner profile from the viewpoint of accessibility. And we are using a, a standard that is called an IMS uh, to represent it in an open courseware. Uh, we are working on this ontology right now and we should, after we finish, evaluate how ontology have, it, if it's supported or uh, what are the risks. So that's it. I hope I was not boring. <laughs> Any questions? You have been talking about uh, accessibility uh, with respect to disability. I have maybe a crazy idea. Uh, uh, this could be something similar as user preference. Like, uh, let's say uh, I'm laying down uh, in my bed and I would like to only hear, uh, only, only through, through ears uh, to, to communicate to, to uh, the sight or something. Uh, so, have you been considering uh, such options, like or, or this research area uh, as user preference of uh, to choose interface based on temporal? Yes, uh, temporal, yeah, there, uh, there, disabilities. Yes, there are some studies that you don't say that this is for disability. This is for special circumstances, like for example, I don't want well, I want to read because there is a, a noisy place around me, so I don't want to hear something like that. Yes, there. There is some work about this, but we are mainly uh, focusing on disability. But I can check something like that. Um, what are the areas and how they present the preferences, maybe. But uh, we are very concerned about uh, people with disabilities and especially the cognitive disabilities. So, but I can check this because we can take something from this. Yeah. So it's a good point. Yes, I, I check. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe one more uh, little question is uh, whether there, you know, there are a lot of options nowadays uh, from software and hardware features like mobile phones and yeah. different sensors and uh, or, or uh, from software points, some gestures and everything like this. Did you find any ontologies or, or standards about this to classify? Yeah, but I didn't uh, work on this because we have mobile accessibility standards and there are some other access accessibility standards for each platform or how to make your website accessible for different platforms. But uh, this is not the field I'm uh, working on or uh, concentrating on. I'm only concentrating about uh, making for now on the web, not on a mobile or other device. Yeah. So, yeah, I know, it's but for now, yeah, sure, this is an open area, area and this, all, all people are using anything else other than the computer now, yes, you okay. are right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. So, the next presenter is
it's uh, Francesco Gandulo. Gandulo, sorry. And uh, we will be talking about uh, nearest queries of uh, distributed binary trees starting from Randall node. My name is Francesco Garduro and I work for Italian Aerospace Research Center and uh, I will present uh, um, will present a work in uh, collaboration with the uh, University of Naples Federico II. Uh, this work proposed a um, new distributed data structure based on a metric uh, data structure. In this presentation, uh, I describe algorithm for binary trees, but currently they are extended to other metric structure, uh, such as the extensions of a binary tree to multi-dimensional multi data, such as kappa D trees. Uh, this data structure is distributed uh, across a network of logical peers, where each peer hosts a part of the tree and the communication between nodes or peers are realized by message passing. The advantages of this approach are essentially two. It can be possible to handle a huge number of nodes and points than a single peer-based architecture, and it can be um, is possible to run multiple queries efficiently, simultaneously. Uh, in particular, we propose, uh, as example, a version of kappa nearest neighbor algorithm that is able to start its execution in a randomly choose node or peer of the network. Uh, why we should use uh, this uh, metric data structure in uh, knowledge uh, management application? The, here, there are some examples. In information retrieval, suppose we index a set of words using uh, such a, um, a lexical semantic uh, similarity measure. Uh, in, this, in this way, we can index a set of words or concepts, and we can retrieve the words that are similar, similarly, semantically similar. In general, if we define a similarity measure between objects, uh, objects such as individuals, images, uh, uh, named entities, we can use uh, such a kind of metric data structure in order to retrieve similar objects with respect to the uh, similarity measure that we define. Uh, for example, uh, many novel uh, data mining uh, algorithm for the clustering that I use is kappa D3. Here, the, 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 the objective is to efficiently handle a huge number of objects, where efficiently means that the, the, um, the time complexity is not greater than all of the n, big O notation, where n is the number of points that we uh, store in the tree. Here yeah, an example of a binary tree with, uh, um, with uh, a lot of nodes and the first, suppose that this tree is big enough that it cannot be handled what, with a single computer. The first uh, operation that we must perform is to map nodes on the logical peers. This mapping is not, uh, say, uh, only which host, which peer hosts which nodes, nothing else. So the result can be as uh, this in the figure, where the, the, pre the previous tree is distributed over the peer from P1 to P6. In this simple mapping, we have that uh, each peer contains a, 
uh, a tree, but this is not uh, a requirement. The peer nodes can be also distributed in, in any way over the peers. If we uh, preserve the original links of the tree, we can use the well-known searching algorithms that are efficient algorithms for, uh, for querying. The only change required is that PEI will delegate PJ, the remaining part of the search, if the next node to be visited belong to the peer PJ. Let me say the peer number one, when, if the, the search must continue on the peer P3, then the peer number one sends a message to peer number three and waits for the answers for, uh, from the, the peer number three. Then when uh, P number one waits for the answer from the other peer, it can elaborate another query and they can start another query and until uh, he must send another message to another peer and then wait from the answer from that peer. When uh, peer uh, number one receives the answer from the other peer, then elaborates the partial results with the part of the tree that he hosts and then sends to the caller the correct answer. Um, this uh, um, communication with messages is independent of the mapping of the node and the peers. The only thing that is important is to, to preserve the link of the original tree. Drawbacks. Uh, as we can see, the peer that contains the root is the bottleneck of the entire system because it starts every query and it waits for the results of every query. And uh, in our trial we see that the, mm, the performance of such a data structure can be worse than the tree based on a single peer. So we need an, another strategy to perform the, the query over a distributed um, tree. This work proposes a distributed search algorithm that can start a query from any randomly choose nodes. And uh, currently we uh, propose also a condition to determine if a query has been completed then there is no need to go back to the root of the tree. So uh, to start a query in a random, randomly choose node, solve, cope with the, the first ballot and then end a query in another node other than the roots um, help to resolve the, the, the point at the second ballot. Uh, call, we call this algorithm a random search algorithm. Uh, it is very similar to the well-known Kappa nearest neighbor algorithms with the, the following changes. If uh, uh, the, the, algorithm, the random algorithm starts an elaboration in a randomly chosen node, the, the, the random algorithm must start its elaboration in any node visited by the standard algorithm, by the Japanese algorithms, and it has a little adjustment that we shall see later uh, on the status of the, the nodes. Um, and uh, we can see that we can easily find unnoted visited by the, the Kappa nearest algorithm. Uh, in order to describe the random algorithm, uh, we see a brief description of the well known Kappa nearest algorithm. The Kappa nearest algorithm essentially alternates two phases a descending phase and an ascending phase. During the descending phase, the algorithm performs one of the this four operation. First, it selects the subtree to visit first, comparing the value of the query points with the split value. Each node of the, the tree has a split value that the algorithm uses to choose the subtree that should be visited first. Uh, or it uh, evaluates 
if the other subtree in the node should be visited using a well-known condition, uh, or if the algorithm visits a leaf, then it collects data present in leaf, because in uh, this implementation of kappa D3, uh, the points are stored only, all only in the leaf. Uh, if uh, both subtrees are visited, then the algorithm ascends to the parent node. In the ascending phases, the algorithm only sets correctly the status of the parent node in order to remember which subtree has been visited. The, the kappa nearest algorithm ends if uh, both subtree are, uh, of the root are visited or one subtree is visited then the other must not be visited. The random nearest kappa nearest algorithm uh, um, perform what we, we call a little adjustment on the status in this way. If the algorithms ascend from a left subtree, then the status of the parent node and the status of the variable is null, then it sets in order to remember that the left subtree was visited. As the standard algorithm uh, done, if the algorithm come from up the tree and descend uh, to this node. It is not, um, the, the paper contains the, the exact algorithms, so if you, if uh, someone is interested in details, you can see the paper. Uh, it is possible to, we can prove formally that uh, the random algorithm and the kappa nearest algorithm always return the same results, and the paper contains a formal proof of this claim. Uh, the last uh, uh, problem to solve is how can we choose a node belonging, belonging to the set of nodes visited by the kappa nearest algorithm without executing it, because uh, the nearest the random algorithm works well only if it starts in a node in a node that is visited also by the, the kappa nearest algorithm. Um, the following property can uh, help to characterize this kind of nodes. It is very simple. If the, if the current node is a leaf and P is the query point, uh, we call P the, the value of P with the mean value contained in the bucket of the node M and the max value contained in the bucket. If uh, this condition holds, then the node M is a node that is visited by the kappa nearest algorithm. Otherwise, if, the, if M is not a leaf, we compare, the, we compare the query point with the split value of its uh, left, its child left, and the split value of the node in uh, the root of its uh, right subtree. If the condition holds, then the nodes belong to the set of nodes visited by the kappa nearest algorithm. Also, the proof of this uh, condition can be found in the paper, or uh, it is very simple to demonstrate. Um, using uh, the starting node property, um, a recursive algorithm that try to reach uh, a node belonging to, uh, to the set of nodes visited by the kappa nearest algorithm can be built. And the algorithm, the main idea of the algorithm is if the current node matches the property or the current node is the root, return the current node. Otherwise, move to the parent. Simply, the algorithms move to the parent if the condition does not hold for the current node. Of course, there is uh, no guarantee that uh, the, uh, the algorithm will stop before it reaches the root. And our objective is to start the, 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 the query in a node other than the root, because the root will be a bottleneck. Um, 
we don't, we don't need to prove the correctness or the efficiency of the random algorithm because uh, the proof of the equivalence uh, give this the correctness and the efficiency. In order to test the random algorithm, we should evaluate how many times to start a kappa test query, the algorithm does not involve the root of the tree. It is not very simple to, de to determine it, uh, it because it depends on the value of the query points, uh, the, ran the random node chosen, and the size of the tree. Uh, for this reason, an average of all possible choice of the query point over a set of the trees with increasing number of nodes and increasing size of the bucket was, ma was made. So we made a, an average on a large set of trees with the increasing number of nodes for all possible choice of query points. So we have the percentage of the successful and uh, in this uh, uh, test bed. Uh, this is the results of the, the, first, uh, the first test. We, we, we use three, uh, each column represents um, a tree, each row represents the size of the bucket in the leaf of the tree. And uh, uh, the row root represents the percentage in which the algorithms traverse the roots, so it's a failure. And no root represents a success. This, uh, this test is not very good because uh, uh, in about uh, 34 cases we, uh, we, we, we do a good work and uh, in about, uh, uh, in the other cases it's not good. So we need to improve the algorithm. The improvement is very simple. And if the, uh, the query point is, uh, is uh, greater than the split value, we go in the, red, in the right subtree of the root. Otherwise, we go in the left. If we go to go in the left subtree of the root, we must choose randomly a point in the right subtree. In order to do this, we must label all the points in the left subtree as left side, and all the, the nodes in the right subtree as right side. It is a simple task because during the construction of the tree, every node simply inherits the label of its parent. Uh, we named the, the random algorithm number two, this, uh, this algorithm, and we can see that the results are very better with respect to the previous algorithms. And uh, in 65 cases, 60%, uh, the query start in a node other than the random, other than the, the root. So, we can, we can, we can uh, see that um, each, new each new query can be sent to a random node or random peer in the network and in about 65% of cases the peer containing the root of the tree will not involve it. So this peer is not, it, it isn't the bottleneck of the system. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No? Uh, is uh, this uh, structure stack, can we add new nodes? Please, can you? Ah, yes. Hello. Uh, it is the same uh, problem with uh, traditional trees and traditional capital trees. In uh, traditional trees, uh, to add a node uh, may require rotation of the subtree. It is, it is a solved problem, and the same approach can be used with the distributed version binary trees. With capital trees, the problem is more complex. 
and it is very difficult add, to add new nodes to Kappa D3 uh, and uh, let balance, uh, because of uh, the tree can, can um, the, uh, the imbalancing, it is not possible to rotate a Kappa D3. It is not too possible to rotate a, a traditional Kappa D3. So it isn't possible, it is possible to rotate a distributed Kappa D3. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes, I think that you are. Uh, we are here. Here. Um, suppose we have the tree. We choose a random node in the, the left subtree. Then the algorithm tests the condition. It, it holds okay. If not, go, go to the, uh, the father. If not, the worst case is log n, is the height of the tree. So in the worst case, we need log n operation to find the starting node. And it is a good uh, thing because the, the search algorithm, the, the kappa leader's algorithm, is a log n algorithm. We have the same complexity. It is not worse than the search yes, algorithm. But, uh, my, my problem is that uh, somehow, I, I'm not sure if it's a truth, but uh, maybe because of the traversal, the direction of the parent, perhaps we are adding additional operations that might actually slow down the algorithm that it was done before. I so simply, it simply tests the condition. If it holds, okay, if not, it go okay. to parent. It not adds a uh, new, new. Uh. Any other questions? Okay, so I will close it. So, thank you very much. So thanks. Last speak, last speech of this of this session. I have a few organizational notes. So first of them is that at four o'clock now we'll go for break. At four o'clock there will be the keynote by Stefan Stab. This event is co-located with the Prague Computer Science Seminar. Also, also other people uh, from basically uh, Prague University will be present. Uh, Right after that, uh, we have the poster session, and at six we are leaving right from the lobby here for dinner. And uh, since there probably won't be a chance to do it, so I also would like to invite you for tomorrow, because we have two candidates for Best Paper, best paper Awards just tomorrow. So uh, we are keeping the best for the last day, and uh, I cordially invite you for the beginning so at nine we have a keynote by Philip Jelesny and afterwards we have two more sessions. Thanks.